Hello, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, hi, so I'm John. I, um, I really like this class. I, uh, Professor Adhikarya and I have been kind of co-teaching it for a while now. Uh, so she's the lead instructor, but I try to fill in a little bit behind the scenes and come in and visit you once in a while because um, the material from this course is something that I feel like lots and lots of people should know. Um, and uh, the infrastructure for the course, like the data science library that you're using, is something that I spend a fair amount of time on, just making sure that it's the right uh, piece of software for people to get going. Um, and so she invited me in today because you're talking about things like group and pivot. And these are features uh, that I strongly advocate, advocated for you learning because I think they're kind of the minimal set of table manipulation features that you need in order to get lots of interesting stuff done. So it doesn't seem like you can, um, uh, well, OK, I don't know quite what it's like for you right now. But, uh, but the number of different kind of verbs that you have on a table, like you can uh, where, or you can get a column, and now you can group, and now you can pivot. Well, those sets of verbs is not huge relative to the number of verbs you know in like the English language. But um, the way that you can combine them basically means that you can express um, really any data manipulation that you want to perform. And the trick is really to get used to using those in combination in order to go from the tables that you start with to the tables that you want, or the visualizations that you want. So uh, I'll teach you one new feature of the data science package called join today. But I'm also just going to go through some examples of things that you've seen before so that if you have any more questions or you're wondering exactly how these things work or how to use them, then you can ask. Sound like a plan? Let's do it. OK, so um, in the Bay Area, there's a bike sharing program. The the way it works is that you sign up online, you give them your credit card, you pay some monthly fee, and then you can go find a bike in the middle of San Francisco that's locked to a station, um, enter your personal information, which is a code, and then it unlocks one of the bikes for you, and you can bike around, and you have 30 minutes to lock it up to some other bike sharing station. If you go longer than 30 minutes, then they start making you pay. Has anyone used a bike sharing service before? One person. They're coming to Berkeley, which is really exciting. And they decided to come to Berkeley and the East Bay in general after they released a data set describing all of the usage of the bike sharing program, which was originally piloted in um, San Francisco and then some other cities in the peninsula. And uh, they kind of released this data set without much of an agenda. They just said, hey, We've learned a lot about how people bike around the city, but not nearly as much as we could learn if we really looked at the data. But we don't have time, so someone else do it. And they, did a, they offered a visualization and data science contest back in 2015 where they basically just gave prizes to whoever did the most interesting thing with this data set. So anyway, it's sitting there on the public, um, on the public web, and we can take a look at it ourselves. What have I done? Okay. So, I just grabbed the 2015 version, uh, and I have a local copy just in case the Wi Fi is bad, but you can download this directly from the web as well. So, here's a trips table, which is one of several tables they released. And this one describes all the bike trips. So a bike trip is a row. It has an ID number, a duration in seconds, when it started, where it started, where it en when it ended, and where it ended, and then the number of the bike. So every individual bike has a number. And then this subscriber type is basically whether this person's paying the monthly fee in order to ride as much as they want, 30 minutes at a time. And here's some information about the subscriber, which I'm not sure is entirely accurate. Okay, and so each row is a trip, 
And how many bike trips were there? Well, actually, there were a lot. There were 354,152. Now, some of these are really long, and we're going to just ignore those right away. So occasionally, people like, well, well uh, I guess we can look. Uh, trips, that sort, duration. That's what it's called. And um, we want descending equals true. OK, so some of these durations in seconds are like a really long time. What's going on there? Basically, someone just stole this bike <laughs> and never brought it back. And then they recovered it you know, ages later. Or sometimes people will take it for weeks at a time. That's not really how it's supposed to work. What's supposed to happen is you take it for 30 minutes, and then you bring it back. So um, let's just restrict ourselves to where duration are below 1,800 seconds. That's 30 minutes. And we'll call that um, commuting. So we still have 338,000 of these. We've just gotten rid of like you know tourists who take it out for the whole day. Um, and we can look at a histogram of the durations. OK, so this is in seconds. We can see that most trips are pretty short. So 600 seconds is like 10 minutes. And then the ones that are half an hour long, well, they're much less frequent. Is that the whole story? Well, if we create more bins, we can see more detail. Oh. I don't know if you've seen this before. You can just put an integer for the bins, and it will guess about exactly how big the bins are. But you could also uh, put in a range to say, I want to go from 0 up to 1,800, and I want the size of my bin to be just 10 second increments. And then we see um, how many trips fall into each 10 second bar. So that's what biking around the Bay Area is like. So you, uh, some people are racing, racing to get under that 30 minute mark so that they don't get charged. But most people finish their trip well before that so they don't like risk having to pay. Any questions so far about what this data set is describing? You're with me? Well, oh. excellent. The people over here nodded, and the people over here didn't. But I think that's because I was looking over there. So, okay. um. All right, let's take a look at this notion of duration. So if we just pick a few of the columns, we can look at the start station, the end station, and the duration of the trip. Let's call that a duration table. And what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to look at um, how long it takes to get from one place to another. How do we do that? So right now, we have a table of trips. Each one is a bike trip. What we'd like is a table of stations that says, how long did it take me to get from this station to that station? There's some grouping there. OK, so if we were only grouping by one station, we would just use group. We would say, uh, I guess whether I use, why don't I use commute so that I ignore the tourists? Sorry, tourists. OK, so if I just wanted to know like how many uh, trips started at some start station, then I would use group. And um, that would figure out the counts of each start station. And here I've sorted them to figure out which one's the most popular. So we've kind of already learned something about the world. People use these things to get from Caltrain Station. This is the downtown San Francisco Caltrain Station. And if you go here, you can get a bike, and then you can bike somewhere in San Francisco. 
People also use it from the ferry building. So if you take the ferry building across to San Francisco, you can get a bike and bike around. Um, and these are like various places in San Francisco. So that's if I only cared about one station at a time, I would use group. I would group by the station, and I would look at some information. But if I wanted to look at pairs of stations, like going from here to there, that's where I use groups. And groups says I'm going to group by the values in multiple columns at the same time. So group is about grouping by the values in one column, and groups is about grouping by the values in multiple columns. So if instead I said commute, dot groups, I have to, at this point, make an array that tells me which columns I care about, the start station and the end station. Then what I get is a three-column table with unique combinations of a start station and an end station along with the count. So there were 54 trips that started at 2nd and Folsom. They biked around in a circle, and then they went back to 2nd and Folsom. Maybe they got a donut along the way. Uh, there were many more trips that started at 2nd and Folsom and went to 2nd and South Park, which is pretty close by. OK, so the reason I need to use groups is because there were two different columns I wanted to look at at the same time in order to create an output row. Question? Ah, great question. So how do we get the order for this result of groups? In the process of grouping, it sorts the values by their natural order, which for strings is their alphabetical order, and for numbers is just increasing. So if you don't specify an order, it's going to sort for you anyway. And that's because the process of grouping is, um, I mean, one natural way to group things together is to kind of sort them all and then look for clumps in that sorted list, and that's exactly what it does behind the scenes. Other questions? OK, so here's where we start taking advantage of what you can do with groups. Instead of just looking for which are the most frequent start and end stations, we could ask, how long does it take to get from one station to another? I'm just going to move this down here. So the information I need, OK, so first of all, when I, com when I commute dot groups on start station and end station, I ended up with a table with only 1,629 rows. So those are all the different station pairs where someone actually biked from one to the next. The duration table is just uh, the commute table where I've thrown out some information. And so I'm left with the start station, end station, and duration for each individual bike trip. I'm back up in the range of 338,000 different trips. What I'd like to do is say, for each pair of stations, how long does it take to get from one to the other? OK, what do I do? Pivot table is a good suggestion. Um, but I'm going to do it in a minute. Right now, I'm going to use groups again, but I'm going to groups with different arguments. OK, so what uh, you've suggested is to use a function to aggregate all the durations in order to figure out like what's the mean duration. And the mean duration is kind of boring, because like average people might be slow, and I think life is just a huge race. So I'm going to look for the minimum duration. What's the fastest person ever to get from one place to another? So the way I do that is I take. Uh, my duration table, which is just like my commute table, I instead still say I'm going to groups by um, the zeroth column and the first column. But now I'm going to specify a function that collects all the durations. And in this case, I'm going to use the min function. So what happens now is that I get a table, again, 1,629 rows or whatever it was. And uh, so each row has a unique start station, end station pair. But here, 
we have the duration in minim minimum duration in seconds that anyone ever took to get from here to there. Okay, so someone managed to get from second and fulsome to second and fulsome in 61 seconds. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Let's give this a name. So this is the shortest time that it takes to get from one place to another. Any questions so far? Okay. If you have a question and I don't see you, you should wave vigorously. Okay. Um, let's just focus on one particular start station. So where the start station values are equal to um, this one. So these are people who took the bar to Civic Center and then got a bike and then biked somewhere else. Um, and we're going to sort by the duration and call this table from Civic Center. OK, so now I've taken just a piece of my original shortest table with some sorting. So the start stations are all Civic Center Bar, and the end stations are all the places that you can go from Civic Center Bar. And this is the actual shortest time that anyone managed to get from there to there in seconds. Now we see 60 pop up again. How come people didn't do it in like 12 seconds? I think there's some like minimum time in the system where you always get charged for 60 seconds, because I never saw a number lower than that. Um, but all these other numbers, they're really describing how long it takes to get from Civic Center BART to market at 10. So now we've learned something about the world from data, commute times. And this can be useful if we're going to suggest people how to get from one place to another. No questions? OK, let me do a quick review. Oh, there's a question. Uh-huh. Can I explain the expression? Is it big enough, by the way? Does anyone want it bigger? Yeah, OK. All right. When you call groups, you first pass in an array of the columns that you're going to group by. So you're going to get a row for every unique combination in those columns. The second argument says what to do with all the other columns. So the reason I limited myself to so just start station, end station, and duration in the duration table is that I wanted to say I don't care about like the start date anymore. I'm going to focus on this one attribute. And uh, what min does is it applies minimization as a function to an array of all the durations for all the trips that went from second and Volsum to second and Townsend. So the story here is, how do you do something with all the other columns besides 0 and 1? And besides 0 and 1, well, there's only one other column. That's column 2. And so we're minimizing the duration. If I'd kept around something else, like uh, the bike number, and I had used the same expression, I'd actually end up with four columns. The minimum duration, which is interesting, and the minimum bike number, which I think is quite a bit less interesting. Um, because, like, who cares which bike they rode? Although, you might care. Like, maybe one of these bikes is really fast, and that's why they got the record time. Is that helpful? OK. Yeah? Does it sort by both, the duration and bike, or does it sort by only one of them? Oh, um. Groups doesn't really sort by either duration or bike number. It sorts by default by the things you grouped by. 
So that would be the start station and end station. If you want to sort by duration, you got to do that yourself. Uh, on the screen, it says sort two right here. That says, okay, so let me revert this to its more natural state, which doesn't have any bike numbers in it. Um, I use sort two here in order to say that I want it to be sorted not by alphabetically by the start station, but instead by the minimum duration to go from one place to another. So this tells me like, uh, well, wh what do you think is like the property of these stations? given that I sorted by minimum duration. They're probably close by. All right, let's do a quick review of all these things, see if you have any more questions, and then we'll go into something new. Okay, so group aggregates all rows with the same value. The first argument says which column to group by. This optional second argument says how do you combine values from other columns? And you can sum them, or you can take the max or the min or the average, or you can just put all those values in an array, which you'd only do really to kind of look at them. And then groups is like group, except for it looks at multiple columns at a time and aggregates based on combinations of values in those multiple columns. So a combination of a start station and an end station, which are in two different columns, is how you get a row in the output. The first column tells you what to group by, and it's an array of the columns that you want to group by. And then the second argument, again, says how you combine the values. Take the minimum or whatever. Okay. What about pivot? You saw that last time, right? Think about groups if you ever want to know what pivot does. Groups method aggregates over all rows that share a combination of values. Well, so does pivot. Pivot aggregates by combinations of values, but instead of organizing them in a table, it organizes them in a grid. Now, a grid is also a table. But let's see what we can do with that. So the first argument says, which column gives the pivot columns? The second argument says, which column gives the pivot rows? And uh, let's leave it at that and do an example, and then we'll talk about pivot values. Okay, so um, let's say I wanted to know how many trips went from a start station to an end station. We could take the commute table, we could pivot by the start station, whoa. And the end station, let it churn for a little while. Now, why is it taking so long? It's because there's 300,000 different trips it has to consider. It has to tally them all up. And what you see here is a column for each start station, a row for each end station, and then the number of trips that went from second at Townsend to second at Folsom is 554. So if I took the duration table, okay, so let me stop there. Any comments, questions? Okay, so there's like more stuff on the screen than there was before, but it's really just like the groups table that we had. Uh -huh. Why does it specify end station and not Also, end station is like a label for this column. So it's saying all these are end stations. And um, these are all start stations. And instead of labeling them all start station, we've actually labeled them with the value of the start station. So this is kind of what pivot does, is it says uh, each column has a label. Here, that label is now a value to say this is a summary of everything that happened for that particular start station. Mm -hmm. So the top is start station? Yeah, so these are start stations, and this is a column of end stations. And that's because I pivoted with start station first, and so that specifies the columns. Yeah. Yeah, so if you don't tell it how to aggregate the other columns, then you're just going to get counts. That's the same with group and groups and pivot. 
All this is going to do is tell you the number of rows that, um, that you know, went from this place to this place. And you see some interesting patterns here, right? So like fifth at Howard, there were people that went to second at Folsom and second at South Park, et cetera. But nobody went to this mysterious place called Adobe on Almaden, which is probably not mysterious to many of you who live near there. And nobody went to California Ave Caltrain Station. Why didn't they go to these places? Because they're in different cities. These are far, far away. The way you'd get there is you would get rid of your bike and get on the train and then take the train there. So we see, because there's like blocks of zeros, that's kind of clustering of these different cities. OK, the other thing you can do with pivot is you can specify not just counts, but an aggregation of any values that you want in a different column. So the pivot method aggregates all values in one column that share the same combination of values for the pivot columns, the first two that you specify. So the first argument tells you which column values you'll have, the second argument which row values you have, and if you give a third argument, that will be a column of pivot values that are going to tell you how to populate the grid. And then you need a function that tells you how to combine multiple values together. I see some of you writing, so I'll pause for a moment. But I'm going to post these slides so you can look at them later. OK. Uh, whoa. So what's an example of that? Let's say I didn't just want the counts, but I wanted to know for all the durations, what's the minimum? Then I'll compute a pivot table where each r column of this pivot table is like this table we built here. So this was a description of from each start station to each end station, what's the fastest trip that was ever made? And here's that for every single start station, like Civic Center uh, here. This is from Civic Center to second at South Park. The fastest trip that it was ever made was 290 seconds. That's like a lot of information that you're packing into one table is to build a grid that looks like this. And then you can make comparisons and see, oh, from Civic Center BART, people got to Second and South Park faster than if they started at Broadway and Battery. Mm -hmm. um, if you give it a third argument, do you have to give it a fourth? If you want to do anything interesting, yes. Otherwise, it will default to the length again, I think. So when you give it a third argument, you're saying these are the values that are going to populate each cell of the grid, their durations, and the fourth argument says how do you combine multiple durations. What have I done? Oh. Um, all right. Yes. They could be categorical. So the question is, could the pivot value, so that third argument, be something like a string label describing it? Um, you'd need a function that does a good job of operating on those. So just saying like the minimum of a bunch of categories, where those categories are you know, color names, will just give you the first one in alphabetical order. That might not be the most useful. But if you wrote a function that said, what's the most common category, then, then that could be really useful. OK. Um, all right, I'm going to delete that for a second and go back to the shortest trips from Civic Center BART to somewhere else. And I'm going to show you a different table. This was also released publicly. This is a table of all the bike sharing stations. It tells me the station ID, the name, the latitude, the longitude, how many slots there are, and a landmark. That's basically what city it's in, and then when they put it in. And when you have data where each row specifies a latitude and longitude, a very natural thing is to put it on a map. 
Let's do that. So I'm going to take my stations table. I'm going to select the latitude, the longitude, and the name of the station, and then I'm going to put it on a map. <laughs> this map apparently comes with sound effects. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this expression for a minute. The marker at the beginning says the way I want to map the elements of the table is by using these things called markers. And then I can zoom in and figure out what's going on. Oh, there's a station down here at Townsend at 7th. Um, once you say you're going to use markers, then you say, I want to map a table. And you have to give it a table with particular meanings for the columns. So you have to give it latitude and longitude. And then the third column is the name, which is optional. If you, want, if you don't want names, you could leave it out. But um, it's a good idea to give your markers names, because then cool stuff happens when you click on them. But the point is that when you build a map, you have to come up with the right table first and then draw the map. So if I wanted a map that just included the San Francisco stations instead of these ones that are way down here in Redwood City, then I would start with my table of stations. I would say where the landmark are equal to San Francisco now I have a shorter set of stations that only includes the ones in San Francisco. And I'd call that the SF table. And then I could map that one. Actually, let's just have one map on the screen at the same time so I don't confuse you. OK, so if I made a San Francisco table, then I could map just San Francisco. And it would give me a map of just San Francisco. So the ones down in Redwood City aren't even there. And let's see what we can discover about this map of San Francisco. So supposedly, the fastest commute times from Civic Center BART, where to get to Civic Center BART, Powell Street Station, Market at 10th, Golden Gate, San Francisco City Hall, Market at 4th, and 5th at Howard. And if we look at our map, well, there's Civic Center BART, there's Powell Station, there's Market at 10th, there's Market at 4th, there's San Francisco City Hall, there's Golden Gate, and there's 5th at Howard. So the data set actually did give us, geographically, all the different um, other stations that are near Civic Center BART. But they didn't always do what we thought. Like, it looks to me like 5th at Howard is a little bit closer than Market at 4th. And yet getting to Market at 4th only took 164 seconds, where it took someone 179 seconds to get 5th at Howard. Why is that? And there's like stoplights. There's all kinds of construction. You have to turn. So zooming straight up Market Street can be faster than having to weave your way to something that's geographically <laughs> closer. Uh -huh. Oh, so this is called open street maps, which is like Google Maps except for free and open. You can go edit it yourself. People have done all kinds of things. OK, so let me tell you a little bit more about mapping. If instead of markers you want circles, you could put them instead. And it looks like they disappeared, but that's only because the circles are really small. So if I said, I want circles of radius 100, then I see a bunch of circles on my map. And the nice thing about circles is that as you zoom in, they grow, whereas markers always stay the same size, because they're just picking out a point instead of a region. Um, so if we look close enough at Civic Center BART, you'll see that on open street maps, this bike station is actually marked with like a little bike. And over here, this one's marked with a little bike, too. So someone who made the map um, put the bike symbols, and they happen to be exactly where the bike stations really are. Hooray. And you can do other stuff, too, like you can change the color to green. Oh. And you can make them huge. Oh, that's useless. <laughs> okay. 
So just to summarize, the table can contain a column of latitude and longitude values, and then you call map table where you either enter marker or circle, and then you give it a table with latitudes, longitudes, labels. If you want a different color for every point, you can put a column of colors, and if you want a different radius for every circle, you can put in a column of sizes, or if you want them all to be the same color, then you specify it there, or if you want them all to be the same size, you specify it there. In your first project, you'll put a lot of stuff on a map. So I wanted to show you what mapping is. OK. Now for uh, a new idea called joining tables. Sometimes the information you want is spread across two different tables. And what you'd like to do is combine them together. And that's typically called joining. There's actually lots of different ways to join tables together. And we're giving you a restricted set that basically is useful everywhere, but isn't as complicated as what you'd see in a typical like full-fledged database system. So if you understand how this join works, you're in a good shape to understand how all the rest of the data science tools are in the world and how they work. Uh, but we've uh, removed some of the like more esoteric features that you'll see in other systems. So we just have one method called join. The join method combines rows in two different tables that share the same value for a column. So that's, oh, the bike trip used this station, and this station has that name. And so now I know the latitude and longitude for a bike trip's starting location. The first argument tells you the column of shared values that you're going to use to join. And the second argument is the other table. So let me just show you some simple examples. I heard you've been doing a lot of ice cream. Can you read that? OK, so um, that just sets things up. I have a cones table that says, here's a flavor and a price for strawberry vanilla. There's chocolate. There's a different strawberry at a different price and a different chocolate at a different price. And let's say I also have a second table that tells me how good these flavors are. So strawberry is like a two and a half star flavor. We all know that. Um, chocolate's more like three and a half stars, and vanilla's four stars. <laughs> so now we have two different tables. We'd like to combine them. Why? We want to get the most stars for our money. So how are we going to figure out which flavor of ice cream gives us the most stars for our money? Well, we need one table that has the price and also the stars. And so we'll do that by starting with our cones table, joining it on the flavor column with the ratings table. And what happens is I get something with the same structure as the cones table, except for I now have a new column, a column of stars, where what happened behind the scenes is that for every row in the cones table, it looked at its flavor, chocolate, it found the row in the ratings table that also had a flavor of chocolate, and it copied over its stars. If there were multiple columns here, it would have copied all those columns over. So join builds one table from two by matching on some particular value. You specify the column of values, then you specify the other table. And then I could do stuff with it, right? I could say, uh, I want to know how much I'm paying for every star. Which I would get by taking the price and dividing it by the number of stars. Oh. OK, so vanilla is such a good deal, because you only pay $1.19 per star. And strawberry is just a you know, pretty good deal, because even though it's so crappy, it's really cheap. <laughs> but this strawberry that's really expensive is still tastes bad, and so you're paying $2.1 for every star of enjoyment. Because that's the kind of thing you can do when you start combining tables together. OK. 
Okay. Question. Could you round the stars, many stars down? Ah, so how do you round things? Well, sure, you could just put mp.round in here. So this is just building a new, I mean, this is just some table called rated, and this is just adding some other column, which I can compute however I want. OK. Um, let me give you some caveats. This is your ratings table. If you take your ratings table, and let me get these two things on the same screen at the same time. So cones.join with ratings gave us this. If I take ratings and join with cones, I get something different. Because I'm going to take every row in ratings, look up its cone, and then copy over the price. But it just grabs the first one that it finds. And so there were actually multiple different prices for strawberry. It just grabbed the first one. So you have to think about which rows do I want to keep, and what information do I want to add to them? OK. That didn't seem to scare you off. Um, one more thing I wanted to tell you about. OK, so let's say you got a bunch of reviews that weren't the average stars, but they were different people's opinions. So one person thought chocolate was a 3. One person thought chocolate was a 4. And everyone thinks vanilla is a 5, because of course it is. In this case, my cones table has multiple chocolates. My reviews table has multiple chocolates. Joining them together means I first have to take one of these tables and reduce it to have unique values. So one thing I could do from this position is I could take reviews. I could group it by its kind and get the average number of stars. Once I have that, then I'm in a good position to join. Now, every once in a while, the name of the column in the cones table is different than the name of the column in the, that you want to join with. In this case, I called it kind. So there is an optional third argument where you can say flavor in cones is actually called kind in this other table. At which point now, I've joined together the cones table with a table that I created on the fly that tells me the average review for each kind of ice cream. And I've looked up the flavor in this average review table to find its kind, and then I've copied over its average star rating. So that's the one way in which you can start combining these ideas together of grouping by category. When you join things together, you have to join on categories, because you have to look for matches. And so grouping and joining kind of go together, because you group by a category, and then you join that information in. Is anyone nervous about what they see on the screen, like what happened to strawberry? What happened to strawberry? OK, so what happened to strawberry is that we actually went through all the cones table. But since strawberry didn't appear in the table I was joining with, it got dropped. So all that was left were all the cones rows where we could actually find a matching kind. That's something else that join does, is it looks only for matches. And it tells you about the matches, but it drops everything that doesn't match. Question? Oh, kind I just made up. So I made this table from scratch right here called reviews. And reviews had a kind column and a stars column. I just wanted to show you, you don't always have to call it flavor. If you call it something else, you can still join in the end. Uh huh? You said kind was kind of optional on the last one. So yeah. What happens if you remove it from that example? Well, so if I remove it, then it will say, this other table you're joining with doesn't have a flavor column. So it'll look for a flavor column, but it's not there, because it just has kind and star averages. So if it doesn't have a flavor column, you've got to tell it what, kind, what, uh, what the column is you want to join on. OK, we've got five minutes left to join stuff, join together maps, 
and bikes. OK, so we had some reasonable map, which was like all the stations in San Francisco. But let's say we wanted all the stations, but we wanted to color them by what city they're in. Well, we could do that. We could just take all the stations and group by landmark. What does that give me? Well, that gives me Mountain View, Palo Alto, Redwood City, San Francisco, and San Jose. If I add another column to that called color, I can just make up some colors for each of these. Uh, red, blue, green, orange, purple. Nothing special about these column colors, except for that they're all different. So that's my colors table. Now, if I take my stations table and I join it on a landmark with my colors table, then I get the stations table, but with a new column called colors. I also got the count, which I didn't really want. But who cares? Because I'm going to select the parts that I want. So what do I want? I want the latitude. I want the longitude. I want the name. And I also want the color. That's something I can map. Marker.mapTableT gives me all the stations where the San Francisco ones are orange and the Redwood City ones are green. Uh huh? Yeah, when I grouped, I got a count column, and I didn't get rid of it until I selected it away. All right. What else could we do? Um, so remember this table, the from Civic Center table that had durations? Well, let's make a table where we um, wait, and we have the SF table, which is a bunch of stations. So if we SF and join on their name with the from Civic Center table, and what we really care about is the end station. Then we have all of the stations in San Francisco with the minimum duration that it took to get there from Civic Center BART. Once I have that, I can build a table out of it. Let's make them all green. Sorry, I'm going a little fast. I'm just going to pick out all the columns I care about. And now I have a table that says the latitude and longitude of each San Francisco station, its name. I'm making them all green. And the radius I'm going to choose for each one will be how long it took to get there from Civic Center BART. So that's a good uh, table to build circles from. So I just say circle.map table, my circles table. And what I get is a diagram of kind of how far each station is from Civic Center BART. OK, so this one is really close, because it is Civic Center BART. And the ones that are a little bit farther away have a little bit larger radius, because they take longer to get there. And then the ones that are really far away, well, they have a really big radius. And so there's this region where it takes a long time to get there from Civic Center BART. One more, and we're done. Um, Stations.join on name with my starts table. In that, they were called start station. OK, so what does that give us? That gives me the count of the number of trips that started from each station. Station starts. So if I take station starts, I give it a color. Of course, we should choose blue, because this is Berkeley. And then I select the latitude, 
the longitude, the name, the color, and the count. And then I map that. What I'm getting is for each station, how many trips started there. And we see very dramatically that nobody bikes in Redwood City. <laughs> Whereas tons of people bike in all these different stations in San Francisco. So that's basically the center of the world for Bay Area bike sharing. Okay, see you later. Mm.